Today with us, we've got our good friend, Lucy, who I, I know a lot of people are excited to hear from. She's got a really impressive background to sort of a really interesting business. And I'll, I'll hand it to her to introduce herself in more detail and sort of kick things off. Awesome. Thanks, Simon. So my name is Lucy Bourne. I'm the CEO and founder at Inward. At Inward, we provide virtual one-on-one -on -one coaching for all employees, and we hire the top 3% of coaches and counselors. So I started this company just as a certified coach and a registered psychotherapist. I was working with like Fortune 500 companies and CEOs, and I just found the need for there to be coaching not just for the executives but also for all employees and if we really supported staff that way how would that impact uh, company culture and drive success within the company so i really got obsessed with this idea of company culture started really digging into it and you know what is company culture and how do we really think of it so some people may think you know ping pong, it's happy hour, it's the Friday weekly wins meeting, but really what it is, it's how we show up on a daily basis, the unwritten rules of how we show up. So it's when the boss isn't around, it's when people aren't telling you what to do, how are we showing up and how are our teammates showing up? So Peter Drucker famously says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think this is more prevalent now more than ever with everyone working remotely. So People are disengaged. They're feeling a little unmotivated, maybe. There are a little bit of Zoomies going on, you know? So how do we keep people really motivated? Also, companies are growing and adjusting to this new COVID climate. So a lot of people are being put into new leadership positions. You know, they're feeling like they're being challenged, but they're also maybe not having the skills or feeling really, you know, burnt out and feeling overwhelmed. So how do we create a culture where this is being tackled and people are feeling really supported? They're feeling like they belong. And how can we actually do that? So this is where organizational psychology can come up. So where companies often go wrong with company culture is that I think that company culture really only exists at the company level. We're really the strongest company cultures are made up of strong teams. So culture is most important at the team level. And we have to realize that each team is unique. So really with organizational psychology, how we see it, we recognize that Teams are made up of individuals and the, one of the strongest ways and most systemic ways we can make impact and change in company culture is to really help and work with those individuals to help them grow in their personal and their professional life. So organizational psychology, we take that like bottom up kind of approach. It's funny because I, I have not seen this presentation. This is the first time I'm seeing it as well, but that's something that we ascribe to at Humi as well. And one of my co-founders often says, there's no such thing as company culture. It's just a, a, an amalgamation of individual team cultures that form this whole. And that if you try to go top down, it's, it's there, there's no way to, there's no way to in affect change through that type of strategy. So it's interesting to see that kind of the way that we've been strategizing internally around yeah. forming a strong company culture, which we also believe is more important than strategy as a whole to a certain extent, <laughs> is in line with your thinking. I, I, like, I like that. Yeah, so this is like kind of the idea that really we're looking at the individuals that are making up the teams that are making up the company culture, right? And how we can impact and really impact the individual to be thriving and showing up and impacting their team dynamics to impact the company and drive success. So organizational psychology, this is a traditional definition. It's the discipline of the science of human behavior relating to work and apply psychological theories and principles to organizations and individuals in their places of work, as well as the individual's work life more generally. So that's, that's quite a mouthful, but the principle there is that it's really looking at how, a holistic point of view regarding individual organizations and the team and how they're all connected. But for the principle, for the our conversation today, we're going to use my definition that I created, which is a lot simpler. And I view organizational psychology as our ability to show up wholeheartedly and trust that our team is doing the same. Mm. So I really like to use a metaphor. So Simon, let's say you and I and two other members of your team are in a car together. Okay. And we're driving along and suddenly we hit really treacherous terrain and the fog sets in, we can't see, it's getting dark, and it starts to pour rain. Um, instead of you and I turning to one another and going like, pointing the finger, like, who picked this route? And like, <laughs> everyone's getting frustrated and a little antsy and a little angry. Instead, we're all going to take a moment, and we're all going to go inward, and we're going to really look at ourselves and try and show up as the best version of ourselves, 
not only for ourselves, but for everyone else in the car. And we're going to trust that everyone else in the car is doing that work as well for each other. So it's this sense of dependability, of trust, but also that we're taking our inner tools and resources to show up as our best. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit of working together and trust that everyone else is doing the same. Right? Yeah, and I, interestingly enough, I know this is a total aside. I think that a lot of that can come from, you know, building autonomy within teams. And maybe you're gonna to get to that later, I don't even know, but I think that, you know, giving people the ability to feel that way relies on leadership saying that, you know, they, they have the, uh, the, the freedom to, to feel that way and act independently, as well as, you know, some sort of dedication to ownership over whatever part of the business they're, they're in control of. And I, and I think that this, that's a great, uh, that's a great analogy though, the car, hopefully windows open, everybody's wearing masks, four people in a car. Yeah, 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 these exactly. days. But yeah, I, I think you're getting on the, also the point of leadership, like how do we lead and how do we kind of lead in this way? Right. And that's something we're going to get into as well. So, you know, how do we create this mindset that we're talking about of like, yeah, it sounds great. Everyone's showing up in the car and they're being their best and everyone's working as a team together. But like, how do we actually apply that within a company to drive performance, to drive success and to impact company culture? So we're going to look at the top seven kind of organizational psychology tools to build these effective teams and to drive company success. So the first one's emotional intelligence. So how do we use emotional intelligence? And emotional intelligence is our ability to understand our emotions and the emotions in other people, really what's at the root of them, and then taking that information and acting in response to it. So I like to break it down into two steps. So there's emotional awareness of like really understanding the emotions and what's going on and gathering all this data. And the step two is going to be emotional intelligence of what do we actually do with this information and how do we make conscious decisions and act in response to it and in alignment with what we're being told. So emotional awareness. So I'm gonna give a few examples, but really emotional awareness is realizing that there's your first initial kind of emotion. And then what's the emotion underlying that? So, you know, if we're at home and you know, there's getting in an argument about how to unload the dishwasher or load the dishwasher. And then, you know, someone leaves wet towels on the floor or you're presenting at work and your boss criticizes the presentation you did. What's the, what's your going to be your emotion that you're going to react? And a lot of times it's going to be like anger and frustration, but emotional awareness is going, okay, what's behind that? If I dig a little deeper, anger is like, you know, type of the iceberg, what's all the way underneath? What's the other 90%? And for these situations, it might be feeling hurt, maybe betrayed, maybe undervalued. And so we kind of do a little pause to take a little bit of a debrief and look. And then we kind of stop and go, what's the context of the situation? So the situation is that someone left wet towels on the floor. But right, that's all that happened. But suddenly, what's the story that we're attaching to it? So suddenly from this or my boss criticizing my work, I'm going, why does no one value my opinion? Why can't I ever work hard enough? What is like, what is going on that suddenly I'm not seeing no one values me? How do we suddenly get towels to like, no one values me in my life? Like, how does that kind of come up? And <laughs> so, <laughs> right? like, so how do we understand and it's not necessarily true and we're not looking at that but we're starting to realize how are these emotions being tied and what stories are we telling and when we have this data now suddenly we can respond in a different way so we can go okay i'm going to choose to not listen to the story or rewrite the story maybe i'm going to choose how i'm going to respond what do i need in this moment maybe i need a five minute break and like to really al get listening to our needs and that's emotional intelligence but what's really interesting is we can start doing this with other people in our life, not just for ourselves. So this is great for self-reflection, but suddenly now when your boss gets angry um, at people who showed up late and he's getting super frustrated or she's getting super frustrated, you know, what do we actually do? We can actually now go, huh, I wonder if they're actually angry or are they feeling like they're not prioritized? Are they feeling overwhelmed? What's, what other aspects are going on in their life and how might we shift how we're responding to them and how could that change dynamics? So this is what emotional intelligence is. It's picking up on our own emotions, the emotions of others, and changing how we might respond in a very specific and intelligent way. So I know that's kind of, kind of a big concept, but, but it, it ends up shifting a lot of dynamics within teams when you start trying to have that curious and non-judgmental kind of attitude regarding, regarding these interactions. So now we know all this information. What do we do with it? So we now know that we're feeling upset, we're feeling undervalued. How do we actually communicate this? So this is the qu quadrants of communication, but 
a lot of times it's also called nonviolent communication and it's something that's really recommended <laughs> within companies actually a lot of entrepreneurs recommend this book and it's the idea that okay great i have this information how do i communicate this within my team in a way that's not going to cause conflict and it's going to be proactive right we want to be able to express ourselves but not feeling like it's going to start another argument or raise conflict within teams we want to do this in a really healthy way and so the way we do this is when this happens, i.e. the context of the situation, when this happens, I feel undervalued or deprioritized. And you can even attach your whole story, even telling yourself if you want to share that, but usually you can just say your emotion. Um, what I need is this. So like when you show up late for work, I feel deprioritized, like no one's respecting me or valuing my time. What I need is for us to sit down and really have a conversation about how we both want to prioritize our time. Like this is what you need, but also making it a brainstorming session with the other person. So they can also maybe share what they're going through or what's going on for them. It gives them that space. And then so that we can blank, what are you working towards with this other person? You guys aren't on opposing teams. You guys are both working towards something. You're not bringing this up because one of you's in trouble or one of you's angry at the other person. You're bringing this up because the end goal is that you're trying to achieve something together so that we can have a, a relationship based on respect and productivity and like really making it feel like you guys are working towards something together. So this can feel a little uncomfortable to get started, but if this gets integrated into the company culture, it makes these hard conversations easy to have and get through them really quickly. Yeah, and I think that's really important, tying in objectives around, around any type of piece of feedback, right? Because often feedback, if provided in a vacuum, is hard to understand. When you allow somebody to say, so that I can you know, do this, it, it puts context around the ask. And the feedback is often really an ask, right? Like, even yeah. though you're providing feedback to somebody else, you're asking them to behave differently. And, yeah. <laughs> and feedback's really hard to provide. And unless there's an easy construct to put in place, a lot of people won't feel comfortable providing any feedback at all. And it's something that, you know, for a business like ours, and I'm sure every business kind of struggles with pulling feedback out of the people within the company in order to make the business better. Um, and so it's really cool. I haven't seen this construct before with these four quadrants, but I really like it because the violence of any type of conversation like this can often make people fearful around having a conversation in the first place, which, you know, isn't healthy for the business either and or for the individual. Yeah, I, I recommend everyone to check out the, the book, Nonviolent Communication. It's super interesting for working within companies. But also, as you're saying, like, someone, it's hard to give feedback, but also if knowing that someone's giving using this framework that you're not taking it so personally, you're like, right, they're just kind of setting boundaries and telling me what they need. And I'm, and I have a space now to also share, like, when this situation happened, I felt this way in response to it. And kind of what I needed is like, hey, I need these meetings to be in the afternoon or more. Like, I don't know, but this gives a space for both sides to kind of also do both sides of the communication quadrant. So, so it can be really interesting if this is something that starts being integrated in. So I highly, I highly recommend it. And based on that, like, so now we have, you know, awareness, communication, how do we make our teams come out stronger? And this is around building resiliency and how do we build a culture with a mindset of resiliency? So, you know, resiliency is not just our ability to get back up when, you know, we get kicked down, but it's our ability to get back up stronger than we were before. So we're bouncing back faster, quicker. And so when this happens, it's when we get kicked at back down, we're seeing getting kicked down is actually an opportunity for growth because we're going, oh, right this is gonna make me stronger when I come out of it. And so we start having this attitude of like, yes, okay, anything, like bring it on because I'm gonna get better from it. So what happens is like the gym and going, you know, working out, we wanna start working out our mind and viewing our mind as a muscle that we wanna strengthen. And so with resiliency, it's so going, yeah, I'm putting myself in front of these opportunities to kind of build up that muscle so that I'm better at getting up and up quicker and faster. And the way we do this, there's two things. We create cookies and yeah, creating cookies is this idea. Love cookies. Uh, yeah, creating cookies. <laughs> so this is an idea from um, Navy SEAL David Goggins and he talks about creating cookies. So the idea of the cookie is that whenever you're faced with a time of adversity, something that's a struggle, you get pushed down and you get back up, it's your ability to go, okay, I'm gonna remember and anchor into this moment and this experience and I'm gonna put it in my cookie jar. And the idea is all the time we're looking for opportunities, whether it's with your kids at work, like where you get pushed down a little bit, you hit a low spot and you get back up anyways. And you are going to now build a cookie jar filled with cookies. And when we do that, we're building up all these positive experiences where we've had setbacks and we remember that we were able to overcome it. 
And when that happens, we have all this positive evidence so that when we're faced with things that are really a struggle, that are really difficult, we know with confidence that we can tackle them. And then what's really interesting is with that confidence, now we start going after things we never would have considered. We push past our own limits because we have that belief system that we can tackle it. So you end up taking out the ceiling and putting yourself now in opportunities within your company to really push past barriers, go after things, push past limitations and come out stronger, better than before and really succeed. I like this a lot, but what I often see within businesses and we try to avoid this, but can't always, is that managers try to protect people on their team from facing those hardships. And as a result, the people on the teams don't get the opportunity to face the hardships that build these muscles. Right. And so, you know, and again, I think that that's all in good intention, right? When a manager is stepping up to roll up their sleeves and take care of a problem on behalf of somebody on their team, they're the champion, right? They think they're doing a good thing. But at the end of the day, it might have negative long-term impacts. So how do you, and I'm curious if, if you have any ideas around how you could potentially you know, advise managers to help employees build these muscles? Like, is it just stepping out of the way and letting people fall on their own and like build, like <laughs> taking off the training wheels? Or are there specific exercises or, or thought processes or conversations that can be had to drive people towards these types of more positive outcomes? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. So I think a part of it is going to be taking a step back, but maybe not fully hands off and viewing it more as like, hey, you guys, it's, yeah, the manager can often solve the problem and maybe they've already solved it, but now going in with the team going like, hey, I'd really, I, I'm struggling with this. I'd really love your help and making them feel like they have autonomy and they have actual a voice in the, in the, in this decision and being able to try and get up and do it on their own. Well, the manager is going to have a, a backup plan or maybe a safety plan. They're kind of using it as a simulation to, and then maybe that's going to shift their original plan, but really making it you know, realizing but that by doing that, you're creating self-sufficient thinking, you're creating stronger employees to actually then relieve some of the pressure on the manager. So the manager is actually ending up helping themselves in this as well, right? You're creating a stronger team from it. So I would think it's more of like changing how we kind of do leadership a little bit as mm -hmm. well. Cool. Yeah. I like it. So the next talk, the next point is one of, I think if you're going to get anything away from this talk, it's going to be on empathy. And I have a quick video here from Simon Sinek talking about empathy and empathy with leaders and companies. So we're just going to give that a quick watch. This is the practice of empathy, that if we're struggling to communicate to someone, if we're struggling to help someone be at their natural best, I'm tired of people saying to me, how do I get the best out of my people? Really? That's what you want? They're like a towel, you just wring them. How can I get the most out of them? No, how do I help my people be at their natural best, right? We're not asking these questions. We are not practicing empathy. We have to start by practicing empathy and relate to what they may be going through. And it will profoundly change the decisions we make. It will profoundly change the way we see the world. It's a great talk. I recommend it. It's only like 15 or 20 minutes, but I recommend everyone checking it out. But really the idea with empathy is how are we giving that space for people to really show up, right? And to support them in that. So empathy, you know, there's the example of we're driving to work or maybe not so much right now, but we're driving in the car and someone pulls in front of us and we're kind of natural response might be like, oh, like, you know, the road rage comes out. But really what practicing empathy in that moment would be having that non-judgmental, curious mindset and going, well, I wonder what's going on in that person's life that they're acting that way. Like, we don't know. There's maybe they have a sick parent at home and this is their 15 minutes to run and do their errand, like, and they're rushing back or that, you know, they're on their way to an important job interview to help support their family and their kids. And you, you don't know, or maybe they're just having a really bad day and they're just, you know, <laughs> like we have to, we don't know. And that's the thing, right? So Practicing empathy is putting ourselves in their shoes and really recognizing a time where we might have behaved that way and what was going on for us. But where people often get hung up with empathy is like, but that person in the car shouldn't have done that. Like that doesn't, ex that, like, that's not okay. The person in the meeting can't just like yell at their employees. Like, right. So this is where we struggle of like separating these two, right? So we have to detach from this idea of right versus wrong. So yes, they might have behaved in not a great way. We're not condoning that. 
But what we're doing, if they're really trying to understand the situations going on from them or what's happened in their life that's making and the tools they have and why they're responding in this way. So what we're kind of having that curious, non-judgmental mindset of really just trying to understand. Okay. So it's a little bit different. So this is the kind of the other aspect of empathy is sympathy versus empathy. So how they're different. So Simon, I don't know if you can think of like something that's it can be real or fake, but something that's been a kind of a struggle in the last week. Um, and I can kind of demonstrate how they would be a little different. Okay. Struggle in the last week. Oof. Uh, <laughs> being too busy all the time and having to cancel on somebody for in a meeting too far too often, let's just say. Okay. So sympathy would look like oh my gosh, Simon, I'm just, that's so awful. Oh, I don't know how you've been managing. Like, that's just completely, wow, how are you doing it? Like, sympathy is like suddenly a person feeling like, okay, like a little judged, a little bit like they can either also jump into like a victim mindset where suddenly they're going like, whoa, me, yeah, I know. I'm just like, suddenly like that's not helping the situation either, right? So empathy instead is really where we're going to connect to a time where we have felt in a similar way. And I might have, you know, not had the same thing. I might have, you know, you might not have had someone, for example, someone tells you they lost someone. You might not have had someone really close to the loss in your life. You might not have had the same situation, but we can often pull on times for ourselves where we felt the same emotion. So I felt overwhelmed, exhausted, guilty, you know, great, like very grieved. Like we can pull on these situations. So the practice of empathy is sitting that in that emotion and really People often avoid empathy because to do it, we actually have to feel that emotion. And so we don't want to go there. So it's much quicker just to practice sympathy versus empathy because we just don't want to feel that pain. We don't want to relate to that sense of feeling overwhelmed. But really the problem here is that usually what do we now? Now we feel that emotion. Our initial thing is I felt that. Now I want to tell you all about this time where I felt overwhelmed and I did this and we start making it about ourselves. So we want to focus on the other person. I don't want to have to tell Simon now, oh, I can one up you on my week that suddenly I had this, this, and this happen. No, we just want to sit in that feeling of being overwhelmed and maybe feeling guilty. And then the next step is connect or correct. So connecting, right? I'm not going to tell him my whole story, but instead I'm just going to really think of times when I've been having a lot going on in my week. And he might have not have told me, he might have just told me a story, he might not have told me exactly what he's feeling. So I'm going to go and go, wow, that sounds like it would be really overwhelming. And then Simon could go, yeah, it is. And might now suddenly go a level deeper than he would have shared instead of just continuing on. So now we get more chances for connection or he might correct me. And this is really powerful too, because now the person feels heard and they can correct someone and take that power. So they go, actually, I'm not overwhelmed. I'm completely exhausted. And suddenly you go like, okay. And then that person will usually kind of go a level deeper. So when we have this, it really creates these, creates these points for connection and for us to get at the deeper root problems and then start kind of working from those. So it's a very kind of different approach and it can be really powerful when we start incorporating that into our company culture. And, and so coming back to it again, from a functional perspective, because yeah. I agree with this, empathy is super important and not enough people practice it in this way. Maybe I even don't. I probably am too sympathetic at times and not empathetic enough. But, you know, it, it is it, things like this that are so deep, right? Like this is a very deep concept. It's not surface level. It is not an easy thing to be like, all right, guys, everybody be more empathetic. Let's go. Like, how, how do you recommend encouraging empathy within an organization behind, you know, besides just saying, let's do this? Yeah. So one big part, I think, is getting used to doing it. I think as individuals, this is something that you can even hold a little workshop and your company on and, and but getting people to practice in their daily lives at the grocery store with that person who's yelling at the grocery attendant, at the clerk, like really trying to practice empathy that way, practicing it, just, you know, trying to getting people to realize they don't actually need to do the connect part of the correct part, but just kind of instilling like, hey, can you guys sit in those emotions and really try not this is getting into our next part, not try and problem solve, but just kind of sit in it with them. And how does that change the dynamics with you guys? Because most companies, they're always trying to, and entrepreneurs and people in business, that's like, here's a problem, let me solve it. Versus just sitting in it with the person, right? So this kind of goes into active listening. <laughs> exactly. So two points, one, opening up a little bit about myself. I do that way too often. I always jump to try to, you know, fix the, fix the solution. I need to work on that. Thank you for pointing it out. The, the other piece though, is a question from one of, one of the participants here today, just around, you know, if you're already a really empathetic person, 
you know, empathy can be great, especially if you're not an empathetic person. Trying to work a little bit of it into your life is probably healthy. But if you're naturally empathetic, you know, how do you create boundaries for, you know, taking too much on emotionally yourself and, and, and that leading to potentially burnout? Do you have any recommendations for where empathy should start and end, not just, you know, the, the value that it might provide? Yeah. And, you know, as a counselor myself, like this is something we really get taught on is compassion fatigue, right? So now you're suddenly feeling all these emotions with people and it starts to, you start to take them on now suddenly as your own thing <laughs> and it can be really overwhelming. So I like to practice almost, this is for those really empathetic people, where you're kind of almost practicing like an observer role where you're in it, but if you are overly getting involved, kind of seeing if you can kind of detach yourself from it and almost watching it and observing it and being trying to almost create like a barrier a little bit. And then re after you've had a very emotionally empathetic experience, kind of taking that pause afterwards to check in with yourself and maybe make some readjustments, maybe take a couple breaths for yourself, like really try, it's more of a self-awareness and how do we respond and are we doing any actions afterwards to kind of recalibrate ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. I like it. <laughs> yeah, so okay. there's 200, there are two ends of the spectrum, right? There and are. so it's a really good. Really there good are. Thing. And you have to be able to manage both. So when we get into active listening and how to do it effectively, a lot of people within companies are always fixing problems. But sometimes when you, I don't know if you found this, happening, like if you're fixing a problem, you're suddenly giving all these solutions and people don't want to hear it. They're kind of like, right? They're like, okay, yeah, but you don't get it. Like, that's, I can't just like do this, right? It's like, yeah, oh, you want to lose weight? Like, just do this. It's like, well, actually that, that doesn't just work, right? A lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how, how do we get buy-in to reduce resistance while not fixing the problem? So the main principles of this is we need to cultivate a learner's mindset. So when we're having these conversations, we have to have the mindset. We don't have something to teach these people and nothing, but really like we're trying to learn and understand and we're really being curious and teach approaching every every conversation like we have something to learn we're trying to understand we're not spending that time formulating a reply or advice or an answer we're not talk thinking well they're talking about a story i can tell an anecdote my little bit of advice that's going to change their life we're just simply listening and by that we're actually realizing that we're going to be more effective that way and we that's a change that's a shift in mindset that we can actually provide more value that way and we actually create self-sufficient critical thinkers that way as well and that's what we want to create within our company, right? Not people who are willing just to be told what to do, but people who can think and act and act with self-sufficient. And yeah, so that's what we want to create. So how do we do that? So there's the Sanskrit word rasa, which means a person's essence. And so it's this acronym of how to do active listening correctly. So first start our receive. So we're going to just gather all this information. We're just going to listen to them. And I would challenge you beyond just not being in your own head, but to really also, when someone's done talking, to hold silence. And that's something that's super uncomfortable for a lot of people, for someone to stop talking and telling you and just hold silence for 10 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute. And what you'll find is that the person will now have the time to process what they just said to you and usually start back up and go a level deeper that if we had interrupted and jumped right in, they would never have gotten there. We wouldn't have gotten to the deeper stuff underneath. So really receive and try and practice silence. I recommend everyone to try at home. It could be a little uncomfortable to start, but it gets easier with practice and you begin to see the value in it. So then A, appreciate and affirm. So when someone's talking, you know, this sounds easy, but you don't need to suddenly be talking for them to feel like they're feeling heard. You really just want to give nods, give, you know, little bits of affirming words like, uh-huh, yeah, okay. Like just let them know to encourage them. Body language, lean in. And if you're on a whole other level, you're going to do linguistic mirroring. And this is really effective in sales, actually. And this is where you're actually going to mirror their body language and their tone of voice and their actions. So when someone's getting excited, you're going to kind of voice drop when when they're leaning in you're going to lean in when their tone gets kind of sad you're going to you know your tone's going to get a little bit more intense or so and then what really interesting and this is really also interesting for sales as well that's a whole other tangent but what happens is is as you start mirroring them you can actually sort of switch it the other way where now if we want to bring the energy up we can start now bringing up our tone and they'll start matching us. And so it's super interesting. I do it in coaching and counseling all the yeah, time. Are we gonna get you in with the sales team next? Like, I mean. 
<laughs> yeah. So that's a whole other presentation. This is, listen, different. this is a whole other, you know, topic. But active listening is actually when I te do teach on sales, this is the core, one of the core components. Well, and the other thing that I was going to say is that, you know, I think a lot of people probably say this and think this, but sales is part of life everywhere you go, right? When you're, when you're trying to work through problems, you're trying to sell your idea. You know, when you are, when you're trying to come to some sort of compromise with the team, like you're trying to, again, like get everybody to buy in, which is again, buying, it's a sales term you know, into, into some sort of an idea. And so I think that sales methodologies can often be applied to handle personal relationships in a healthy way. <laughs> Even though sales is often like, you know, shrouded in, in yeah. some sort of dark cloud that it's an evil thing. It's, it's not, it's just part of life. I couldn't agree more. And doing it where understanding the sales is really just understanding what this person's problems are, how we can be there with them and really build a long-term trusting relationship. And these active listening is a key component of that. So now we've affirmed them, we've maybe done some body mirroring, who knows, we're going to go into how do we respond, and this goes back to the empathy thing of summarizing and reflecting back feelings. So we're going to take this time not to share our own story, not to reply, but really just to summarize what they told you. So, wow, it sounds like it's been a really overwhelming week and you've been having a lot of meetings and, you know, struggling getting back to emails. Like that, that's literally what they just told you and you're just repeating it back. And this gives them the sense that now they felt completely 100% heard that you really understood what's going on for them. And now we can kind of move on. So we've gotten rid of that resistance. So you're going to summarize just what they told you and maybe reflect back what you think they're feeling. So that sounds like it's been pretty overwhelming and then kind of maybe a summary. And that's, that's it. It's pretty simple, but just summarizing what they told you. No like, suggestions. <laughs> yeah, just clicks for them that, oh my goodness, yeah, I felt hurt. I now don't have to continuously repeat myself. I can actually now listen. Like it really shifts and kind of closes that up a little bit. Now ask. So this is not, this is just asking questions to deeply get better understanding, to expand. So can you tell me more on that? What's been going on? Very open-ended. This is not disguising advice as questions. So this is where we're dressing up advice suddenly like, well, have you thought of maybe scheduling, getting a better earlier time you get up and tackling with your emails first thing in the morning and then, you know, fitting in your yoga and da, da, da. like now it's suddenly like how I think you should be acting suddenly disguised as a question with an inflection at the end. <laughs> so, right, we're actually just asking questions to learn more. And this is where we're asking questions almost to kind of coach and guide them and help them think up the answers on their own, and really encourage that self sufficient thinking for them to do dig deeper. And then that's actually that's the way you're going to create systemic long lasting change with a person. So this is really interesting, because again, like, I think that this is one of those areas where I need work, because I often am jumping to suggestions. And I think that a lot of entrepreneurs and leaders within businesses feel as though that's the responsibility. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm curious, like, how do you balance that sense of responsibility? Again, coming back to my comment earlier, managers feeling as though they need to protect their team and do everything they can to make their team more productive. And, and I think it, it bleeds into this same type of mentality where you feel like you always need to come up with the answer for your team and yeah. you feel like you're doing the right thing. You know, there's, there is a line somewhere that where <laughs> you, you should be doing that, right? That's a, that's a healthy behavior when you're solving problems in some respect, but it isn't healthy in other situations. So I'm curious, you know, in which situations is it most important to take this approach and not the dictatorship, I've got the answer type approach? Yeah. Um, because I think that there's a difference, right? And, or at least I would like to believe there is because <laughs> yeah. I often take the more, yeah. you know, solving approach. So that kind of like solving, we need an answer now. You can usually tell there's like a very high deadline. You guys, it's very like option A, B, or C. Like it's very specific. It's very like you guys are trying to come up with something right away together. Maybe that's a time where we don't have the time for it. But a lot of the times realizing that when we do solve that way, we may be getting an instant fix and gratification, but you're not actually helping long term. So I have clients who will come up and I can tell them, like as a coaching counselor, like, okay, this is just what you got to do. A, B, C. And like, I fixed your life. Like <laughs> they're never going to come back or they're going to come back for maybe one, two sessions, but we're not at, and they may get it going and get it working for like a week. And then they, nothing lasts and it doesn't it create change. So realizing as a manager, you're really trying to build up your employees and giving them these critical skill sets for long term. So yes, sometimes you can weigh it like, hey, I really need this problem solved now, and I'm going to take more of this approach if that's the line you want to have. But realizing that long term, it's probably not worth it for you to continuously have this type of approach, right? So you kind of have to do that little bit of internal guessing and seeing when we got to prioritize. So now, flip side, I got a question from, from somebody on the call here. 
which is kind of the opposite, which is what if the person on your team just wants you to fix it for you? Like, it, like the specific question is, how do you respond to people who just want you to fix their problem for, for them? Like, yeah. what, what's, the, what's the approach in that in those types of situations? I think it's a little bit different than this, um, yeah. right? It's a different construct, but I'm curious to get your take on that. That's where we now have to start really creating accountability, right? And this is where we start looking at, hey, I know I can probably help you and I'm going to guide you to fix the problem and we're going to work together, but you're placing the action still on them. I'm going to help you fix this problem. I'm going to help guide you and maybe work alongside you, but it's still your problem to fix. And it's giving them the autonomy and accountability to realize, yes, they have to own this. And when they take ownership of that problem, suddenly now they're actually going to see it through versus now being able to offhand everything. And you're going to see that shift within the team, taking autonomy and taking ownership of an actual case project right so that's gonna it's gonna be that shift so i have clients that you know that's a whole other thing it's like hey well i'm not here to solve your solve your problems for you and that it doesn't work that way and there's a little bit of a psychoeducation aspect you might have to educate about that a little bit but that will kind of impact things quite a bit so so this is a the active listening is a huge huge thing that kind of you can spend a lot of a lot of time going into for sure i need to spend more time on it for sure <laughs> but I'll, I'll let you move on i don't know how much you've got left and and we're already well through the hour so yeah we don't have too much more. So recognition, this is something I find super interesting. You know, how do we provide recognition within a company? A lot of the times when we have high turnover, or you know, that's one of the main reasons. And also that people really want to feel recognized for the work they do, but how do we do it in a way that's actually proper and it's going to really impact company culture? It's one of the number one things to also increase like employee loyalty as well. So there's the CEO and every, every week she would go into her workplace at the end of the week and she would pick out a rock from outside her office and she'd go in and she would put the rock on someone's desk. And that would be the person who maybe displayed the company culture that week, who helped out on a team project, who really hit their goals, helped the company hit its goals. And what happened was it created a frenzy within the organization trying to get this rock. Like people became super motivated to get this rock. And it's funny because it's just a, it's a rock that the CEO just picked up and threw on someone's desk once a week. And suddenly people were so motivated. And it's how this rock action instilled this motivation and the sense of really recognition within the company for the work they were doing with being a kind of a carrot approach versus a stick approach and kind of looking at how that approach is operating within your company. So this is something where now we look at how do we actually instill proper recognition within a company. And there's a great study by Carol Dweck, and she looks at effort versus results. So what happens is she takes a group of school kids and she has them take a math exam. And what happens is, is after the exam, she actually goes and she they take half the group and they praise them for how well they did on the math exam. So that's, you know, you got oh, wow, you got 98%, great job, wow, look at that, you got 97%. And then the other half, we just praised them, well, I saw how hard you studied, nothing about the results. Well, I saw the work you put in for that exam. Like, I'm so proud of you for how hard you tried. Now, next, we offer them, all the students, to take a harder math exam. And those who we praise their results are unwilling to take the exam because they're scared of not getting that recognition and failing in your eyes. Versus those who we praise their effort, they're willing because they know that it doesn't matter how they did. They, they know what you care about is the fact that they tried and they put themselves out there. So when we look at how we apply recognition within a company, we want to start thinking, are we creating a culture of perfection where people are constantly only willing to try and do better because that's the, they have to hit the 100% mark? And are they stopping themselves from trying a lot of things a lot of the time because they don't want to risk it? And so are we creating a culture of mediocrity? And instead, by really recognizing result, um, efforts instead of results, we can help people really be willing to take risks, to think outside the box, encourage that self-sufficient thinking, and it changes the way a company runs, including innovation, creativity, all these things we're looking to try and cultivate within a company. And it's a very big shift of how we usually do it. So I think this is something really interesting to apply. That's gold. That's gold. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, that, that that's one of the best points that you've made so far and something that 
you know, was probably lost on most people, including, you know, probably myself to a certain regard is making sure that you're focusing more on effort than it is just on results. I feel like I was also part of that study. I went to an experimental, <laughs> you know, grade, grade school where they taught us, they measured us in all kinds of crazy ways. So I feel like I lived that life in grade one. That's awesome. Yeah. And then the last one we're going to go through quickly is boundaries. And a lot of the time we think of self-care you know, it can feel a little bit like, oh, we're being selfish with ourselves. I'm putting my needs in front of others, this whole thing. But really, when I think of self-care, usually I think for myself, like, oh, that means bath time and a face mask. When really the most important thing of self-care is usually boundaries and realizing that what are we saying yes to so much in our life that we're maybe saying no to ourselves. And it's the idea that like, you know, when you're flying on a plane, you realize you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you start kind of helping out others. And it's the same here. Like, how are we supposed to show up in our lives and take care of the people we love, take care of our team at work if we're completely depleted? And the answer is we're going to end up burnt out, exhausted. We might be able to do it for a little bit, but then pretty much we're going to be of no value to anyone. So realizing that there's an opportunity cost of saying yes. Every time we say yes to something else, are we saying no to ourselves potentially? And realizing that how is this starting to impact you? So you might've said yes to taking on three new projects at work, to helping your friend move this weekend, to hosting two dinner parties. And suddenly you realize, hey, I can't sleep at night. When I go to bed, my mind is completely wired. I have also haven't been getting up, to, I'm too exhausted. I'm not eating healthy, I'm not working out. I'm actually getting a little angry and snapping at my family members or whatever it is, or at my teammates. And so realizing that, you know, it can start to kind of grow and we might not even realize. So how do we actually create boundaries in our life? And a big part of it is realizing our bandwidth. Okay. So this is like really a self-evaluation. That's a fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Prioritizing, right? I'm not saying you can't say yes to a ton of things in life, but we might need to prioritize some things as a foundational base to take care of ourselves and prioritize top level items, right? So this can even work in a team environment of like, hey, as a team, we just took on these three new projects. What does that look like for us? I'm feeling a little quadrants of communication. I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. How can we work together to kind of prioritize what we're working on so that we also create accountability and expectations among the team members, right? And so it goes back to bandwidth prioritizing and communication. And those, that's a whole other that you can really dive deep into that. But looking at boundaries, starting to kind of look at the scale of, hey, what have I been saying yes to uh, for other people in my life? And what have I been saying yes to for myself? And trying to make sure that, you know, it's not completely going one on the end and, and that we're taking care of ourselves. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I think that this the point around boundaries and the last around recognition are both very interesting in this specific time, everybody working from home. Before I dug in with a couple of questions around how to maybe apply this thinking, given our circumstance, I just wanted to also highlight this is very much so in line with an interesting article I read last week in the Harvard Business Review about people who prioritize time over money. And if you optimize for time, you're more likely to be successful and happy than if you optimize just for money. And I think that it is very much so in line with this concept of creating boundaries and trying to create space for yourself. If you're thinking about how to create time for yourself, you end up working more efficiently, doing all these other things that end up generating positive outcomes. But in these days, in this, in this day and age, in these unprecedented times, yeah. <laughs> you know, creating boundaries is harder than ever, right? Yeah. And, and I'm finding this to be a real struggle even for myself saying yes to so many things, feeling as though every hour in the day is a, is a work hour and yeah. I can do anything. But in reality, we all know that's not true. But yeah. I think a lot of people are doing that right now and taking on much more than maybe they did in the past. Yeah. Um, so getting blurred. how would you recommend approaching this concept of setting boundaries, um, yeah. especially for people who are overachievers? Because I think that those are the ones who end up with that out of whack work-life balance more often than others. Yeah. And then I've got another question to double back to the last thing from some, well, somebody on the call around also how to apply um, the concept of recognition. in, in Yeah, this yeah. so we'll get into it. So really with setting boundaries, especially for overachievers, we can, you know, I include myself in this. I tend to take on a lot and like to do a lot. And the more I go, the more I kind of want to do. And, you know, this can kind of create this thing where suddenly we are feeling a little overstretched. So how do we actually apply this, especially with working from home? So the biggest things, you know, these are recommendations, you have to figure it out for yourself, but is really to start looking at having some block ends for your day, really bookending your day of re and having some more structure around when you actually disengage from work. It's a big one, especially with working from home, putting your phone on airplane mode, having that time to unwind. Because a lot of the time when we have, if you look at it like yin and yang, 
we're having all this yang energy of like, I gotta go do, 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 do. And what happens is we end up burnt out. We need to be putting in a little bit more yin of like some breathing, some calm time, some deep, deep unplugging. And we can go, go, go. But if less we're putting in that time, we need to find a little bit of balance so that we can push ourselves even more. So it's, I'm all for going after and pushing yourself, but we need to have that also incorporated a little bit. And so it's a mat figuring it out for yourself a bit, but. Yeah, so I agree with that. And I think that, I think that that's like a point that many people have made, but when yeah. you were describing boundaries to me here, I felt like there was a little bit of nuance that I hadn't fully considered before, which is this concept of prioritization. A lot of people talk yeah. about it, but it's hard to practice it. But yeah. that is in essence, you know, what ends up driving people to do too much is because you say yes to too many things, your yeah. nine to five, which you blocked already to work is full, is full. And then yeah. something that you probably should have put nine to five comes up. You're like, shit, this is, oh, excuse my language, but this is more important yeah. <laughs> than what yeah. I'm doing at four. So I'm going to do it at five and I'm going to work a little bit late because this is more important than all these other things I'm already doing. Yeah. That opportunity cost of saying yes. I think that is actually more challenging than putting in, you know, the start and end times. And, yeah. and I think, are there any tools that you recommend yes. for trying to prioritize? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I would say it's all about self-awareness and reflection. So at the end of the day, you know, sometimes we have that self-compassion of like, yeah, I definitely overbooked it today. Yep. That, like, that happened <laughs> right in the moment can be a little hard, but like, what's my day like tomorrow? What's the rest of my week like? And so having those kind of check-ins where at the end of the week, every week I do a self-reflection of how I set my week up how I did the last week and how, where I can make changes. And so we need to be taking more pauses at the end of the day, maybe in the beginning of the day, at the end of your week to do that self-reflection work and actively try and be intentional about making a change because we're going to continue those patterns. They're going to come up, but we just need to set that time aside to actually think it through instead of just going hot, hot, hot all the time. We actually need to pause and kind of reevaluate. And so I think it's creating more of that time. I really like that. I need to do more of that myself. And I think what's interesting is that for people who are in manager type roles and yeah. leadership in any respect, they should be encouraging the people on their teams to be doing the same thing. Yeah. And, and that probably doesn't happen enough. I probably don't do that enough. I'm trying more these days because I think a lot of people are busy with yeah. me. Um, yeah. but, but, but that's a really interesting point, that self-reflection and trying to recalibrate on a weekly basis, really, really sharp. Coming back to the last yeah. piece. Oh, I know you got more. Yeah. Okay. Before we go, end, before... I just thought I'd get off the boundary side, but we're completely done. So we can, you know, pretty much all that I was going to say was just that, you know, looking, we covered a lot of kind of big hefty topics and we can kind of at least our last few minutes to answer some questions, but really like, you know, looking, starting, what I want to leave you with is just individuals and how they're showing up and, you know, how they're doing in their personal and professional life. It's going to impact the team and that's going to impact the company culture. And really just as, as companies, we should be focusing on how we can help and support those individuals to kind of reach their potential inside and outside work. And that's, that's truly what I believe. And yeah, I just hope everyone got something out of it, but yeah, we ask, ask away, Simon. No, that's amazing. And, and thank you so much again for everything here today, because this is an incredible session. I find a lot of this stuff valuable for me personally. I'm sure everybody else on the call does, you know, not only were we excited about working with you guys already, but now I'm even more excited about working with you guys within Humi ourselves. And yeah. I think that bringing in people like yourself within organizations to help teach these things can be extremely valuable. So, yeah. you know, this, I, I don't, this is not a shame, shameless plug. I'm plugging Lucy. I think that everybody on this call today probably value, you know, benefit from your services because these are things that are hard to understand without the background that you have. So yeah. I'm, I'm feeling enlightened and I'm feeling excited, but doubling <laughs> back to one of the questions. Yeah. Somebody asked a question around recognition. Mm -hmm. I think that your point that you made around recognizing the right things is super insightful, but in these times, again, these unprecedented times, <laughs> yeah. it's harder than ever to, to create recognition, to create systems and processes to, to ensure that that recognition is happening. It's easier yeah. when you're in a physical space to say, Hey, great job. Or, you know, to be part of a meeting and to provide that recognition in person. And so how do you recommend, or are you seeing any strategies with clients that you're working with right now? to drive recognition in this like virtual office environment? Yeah, so I think incorporating it as part of a structure within your company. So that might be like, you know, a weekly Friday, weekly wins meeting where you talk about the wins or everyone on your team says something, they recognize something that someone else in the team did that week that they found a value. And it's, you know, really creating a little bit more structure regarding recognition within your company. Cause right now it, we're not having those moments day to day where you can, you know, just drop by and say, hey, like, great job. <laughs> but really creating a structure within the company, like, yeah, you guys go over like 
I don't know what your company does. If you have that within your team or company wide, like a record, you know, a win or what you accomplished that week or kind of more like a status update, but somehow tying in now also a wins update of like, Hey, what did someone do that should be recognized or that you found a value and just kind of saying a, a company would thank you and having that person receive that type of recognition for the results and how they helped you out or how they provided service to the company or, or whatever that may be and trying to trying to kind of build it into your company structure so it's a little bit more intentional is what I found really helpful. Nice. Yeah, and I, I agree. And I think that the point that you made there about making it company wide is also super important. I think that things are heightened when there is some publicity around it. And so, you know, rather than just giving people a personal, you know, kudos, often putting it out there in front of the entire company is something that can be beneficial. Ooh, we got a bunch of other questions coming in. So I'll, I'll try to work through them and hopefully I can get to everything in the next four minutes. Yep. Uh, I know we don't have a lot Otherwise, of time. Otherwise, shoot me an email. It's all good. Yeah, actually, just in case anybody does end up having to drop off, we'll circulate the deck. We'll be circulating Lucy's contact information, which is obviously on the screen right now. And you're welcome to reach out to her with specific questions around how to employ any of these strategies or really anything else. She's got a lot of brain power to share with you guys. So <laughs> moving back over to the questions though, you know, I've got a specific question here, you know, coming back to that self-awareness and reflection at the end of a week, you know, for managers, do you have any exercise suggestions that you can do with your team with regard to self-awareness at the end of each week or month to see how everybody's doing, to see if they need to make any changes or if any changes were made? Like, yeah. is there a specific, you know, hey, group, just have a group meeting at the end of every week and like make it a topic of conversation or what, what would you suggest to try to make this a strategy within a business? Yeah. I think starting to create your own kind of meeting structure that everyone kind of fills out beforehand or they can do it in the moment, but usually, you know, starting like, okay, let's start with the energy of like what we're grateful for. Then going into like, okay, what's something that I accomplished this week that I was proud of? What's something that I recognized in a team member that was really great? And then where could I have made some, where maybe do I want to see some change for myself or what I want to work towards where, and where could I use some support? So you know, that's like four questions. It, usually if people prepare it ahead of time, they can get it out in like a minute and a half. And that just, you go around the team wide, whatever, how many big your team is. And then now you kind of have that on record. Everyone filled it out beforehand, maybe you have a document or whatever. And then next week we kind of have a check-in. Okay, how did we all do? That was how we were out last week. You could also incorporate things like what was your high this week? What was your low? You, you can do it to your own kind of thing. But I think having that type of structure also gives people a framework to how to prepare for the meeting, and to actually be intentional about how they think about it. Cool. And so that, you know, that to me sounds like it would work really well with teams that have weekly standups or like weekly meetings for their individual teams. Now, one area where, and again, I know we're running low on time, but one area where I know, you know, this can become a challenge is when you are an overworked team, when you're already having trouble prioritizing, when you don't have any time in your day, you know, and, you know, there's going to be people out there who say, well, this type of stuff, it's fluffy, it's not valuable, like just go do your work. Well, how do you make time for these things? And and especially when there might be resistance within the company or within your team from people who do think that way. Is there, is there, are there anything, is there anything that you would recommend as a final thought to overcome that type of a challenge? Yeah, I think, you know, once we go back to it's resistance, how do we break down that resistance? So really, if there's someone on your team who really feels that way, we need to have a conversation with them. We need to break down that resistance. We need to act and listen, do all these types of things and get them on track that like pretty much when you're working that way, you're working in a vacuum, you're working in a tunnel. And we're not coming up to actually get supported for part of a team. We want to be building and working off one another. And what type of culture are we trying to create? What type are we creating a collaborative culture? Are we creating a heads down, do your thing. And like, I'm going to surface and once in a while, like, I don't know, but like, these are questions that you want to start having and going, Hey, if this is feeling like too much of a thing to do a weekly thing, then we're going to do it a bi-weekly or something, but figuring out a cadence that works for you guys and that works, but realizing that these steps are actually going to help you drive performance because now you're being intentional. Now you have accountability set in with like, Hey, my three things I committed to this week were this, I didn't succeed at any of them. This is where I need help or I succeeded at all of them. And I want to take on more or who needs my help. Like these are the types of conversations we need to be having. And when we have those, we can really shift company culture, but really drive success within the team. Love it. Love yeah. it. And you ended right on time. It's three. I'm sure everybody else has another meeting to hop to. Thank yeah. you again. This is amazing. And thank you everybody for joining us today. For having me. This is awesome. I'm so glad I was able to do this. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Oh, hopefully we can get you back for another one in a couple of months. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much, Simon. And thanks. All right. Everybody. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Hope to see you again sometime soon.
Bye.